Welcome to Nevada and to the 2021 Art and Environment season. The Nevada Museum of Art has organized five exhibitions to serve as the backdrop for land art, past, present, futures. John Franco Gorgoni, Land Art Photographs, features 50 of this Italian photographer's most iconic images of earthworks in the American West. From Michael Heiser and Walter Di Maria to Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson, Gorgoni was on the ground in the late 1960s to help bring these projects to life. For nearly two decades, the Nevada Museum of Art has considered what is next for land art. We've collected archives and artworks for our permanent collection that look deeply at iconic earthworks. We've asked, who are the voices that have been left out of this dialogue? And what artists are critiquing the genre's most iconic artworks? We've worked with and commissioned artists who see land as part of a larger system. And we've acknowledged those who have known this and fought for this all along. Judy Chicago began making work in response to land art in the late 1960s. Her dry ice fireworks and atmospheres performances offered an alternative ephemeral engagement with the land. The Nevada Museum of Art recently acquired this archive and is debuting it for the first time. The desert has always attracted mischief makers. Those artists and dreamers who see and think differently, who aim to experiment in hopes of changing the world. High Desert Test Sites in Joshua Tree, California has offered artists this creative testing ground for over two decades. Rose B. Simpson's monumental earthen figures ascend from the gallery floor in her exhibition, The Four. Commissioned and recently acquired by the Nevada Museum of Art, their overwhelming presence reminds us all that land art and the land itself is more than just the earth beneath our feet. Hello and good afternoon to everyone joining us today. My name is Claire Munoz and I am the Charles N. Matthewson Senior Director of Education and Engagement at the Nevada Museum of Art. Before we begin today's program, I would like to start by acknowledging that the Nevada Museum of Art is located in the Great Basin on the occupied territories of Indigenous people. The state of Nevada consists of 27 federally recognized tribes from four nations, the Numu, Northern Paiute, the Newe, Western Shoshone, the Washishu, Washo, and the Numu, Southern Paiute. We acknowledge, I see somebody can't hear. Uh, sorry, we acknowledge that more can be done to further research and scholarship and integrate the stories of indigenous people and cultures into conversations around land art and our collective knowledge of the lands of this place. We are fortunate to call many artists and leaders of the Numu, Newe, Washishu, and Nugu communities our friends and collaborators, and we welcome and thank those of you who are joining us today. Um, we just saw a really wonderful opening reel that we have used as part of the art and environment season, uh, which was a 2021 season. We concluded the season in November, and today we return to reflect uh, with Rose B. Simpson on her performance that happened um, towards the end of that. This is our final conversation as we officially close out the art and environment season, which centered around topics of land art, past, present, and future. Since launching the first art and environment conference in 2008, the Nevada Museum of Art has built a community committed to exploring how humans interact with the natural built and virtual environments. And today we welcome all of you that followed the entirety of the season, as well as our broader museum audience and community who may not have experienced the season. Today we're pleased to invite Rose B. Simpson to return and share her reflections on that fall performance that was presented in Las Vegas as a highlight of the art and environment season. Rose B. Simpson is a mixed media artist whose work addresses the emotional and existential impacts of our collective humanity. Her work revolves around the figure as proxy from matriarchal or androgynous ceramic to attire performance and custom cars. Simpson has a BFA from the University of New Mexico, an MFA from Rhode Island School of Design, and an MA in Creative Writing from the Institute of American Indian Arts. She has had solo shows at the Nevada Museum of Art, the Will Wright Museum of the American Indian, Pomona College Museum of Art, Colorado State University, 
the SCAD Museum of Art and the University of New Mexico Art Museum in Al Albuquerque. Simpson lives and works in the Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico. For those of you who have visited the museum, you may have seen Rose's sculptural work on view in the exhibition titled The Four. We saw a little preview of that in that opening reel. Rose created this new body of work, which includes the four abstracted monumental earthen figures of varying sizes that appear as though they are ascending from the gallery floor. This body of work and the exhibition came to fruition with support from the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and Six Talents Foundation and is on view through April 17th. And we've invited Rose, I hope she's able to come in April to see that and present to some of our teachers here in Nevada. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the four is now part of the museum's permanent collection and we are extremely proud to be able to steward this incredible body of work. Um, as we get the program started, we'll invite Rose to share her reflections on the transformance, which we'll see here soon. We'll watch the film that documented that performance. And later in the program, we'll introduce you to Fawn Douglas. Fawn is the founder of New Art and Activism Studios in Las Vegas, and was contracted by the museum as the curator of note for the transformance. She was a remarkable collaborator, and we're really happy to have Fawn with us. And towards the end of the program, we'll invite filmmaker Ben Alex Dupree to join the conversation. So for now, I'd like to invite Rose. Rose, it's good to see you. You've had a flurry of the day. Thank you, Claire. I made it. I'm here. Um, I'm excited it. to be here. Um, this, this feels like a really important thing to do is this wrap up and this reflection and this, um, you know, a remembering of the of the time that we spent together and this investment of energy and life and prayer that we put together. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I have to say thank you for all the people that are coming to um, be a part of this moment and spend a little bit of their day with us to, to remember this and to um, explore some new thoughts and feelings around it. Um, and also, you know, the Nevada Museum of Art are so gracious and Claire, you've been wonderful. Um, the new art and activism studios and Fawn Douglas, you're so amazing. Um, and Ben, um, Ben Alex Dupree, it's so wonderful to get to know you and to um, collaborate on this as well. Um, and then I have so much support with my gallery, Jessica Silverman. And also this couldn't happen without the, um, a really amazing grant from the VIA Foundation. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about the history so everybody knows sort of where I was coming from, where this sort of um, idea and this sort of movement <laughs> had, uh, in, sort of initiated inside myself in my process. So um, I, yeah, I, I was raised by um, artists. And so I've always looked at the world through the lens of the creative process whether that's um, art making itself or our relationship to the, the planet and the, and the place we're in. That is culture, that is spirituality, that is um, a very lived um, relationship with place. And um, because of um, the Nevada Museum of Art was hosting the conference, the um, Art and Environment Conference, uh, while simultaneously my work was going to be there, I started exploring this idea of building a performance around the pieces. Um, and I applied for a grant through the VIA Foundation to support this, which initially was going to take place at the Nevada Museum of Art there in Reno. And I was looking for, um, you know, collaboration with people in the area in Reno because of um, what's happening in the world, the pandemic and having to be virtual, a lot of those things had to change. And, you know, because of that transition to virtual, um, we were able to, because the conference was went online, we were able to move the performance and the event uh, um, to um, Las Vegas, Nevada with Fonda. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit of the idea of transformance. Um, when I went to graduate school at the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, in um, Providence, I studied ceramics. So I got my master's degree in ceramics, but I was really interested in the conversation of indigenous aesthetics. So I, um, I participated in seminars that were focused mainly on performance art uh, and relational aesthetics. So I studied, you know, um, Marina Abramovich and James Luna and the people that we consider as uh, 
as performance artists that are, are actively doing a piece that is separate from life. And in the study of relational aesthetics and aesthetics of the everyday, I started to realize that one of the main ways that we can talk about indigenous aesthetics is to um, bring up how art and life is not different. It's not separate, um, similar to land and life and culture and life and spirituality and life. Um, and so what I started doing was um, creating these events that were more about highlighting um, a moment and creating um, aesthetic consideration for something that we might do um, otherwise. And so I went to school um, in Española, New Mexico at Northern New Mexico College for Automotive Science, which is basically low rider school. Um, and I went to school to work on cars and to make them aesthetic experiences because of my investigation into performance art. Um, and the idea that something that we do every day, like drive a car, um, can be an aesthetic experience. And so I investigated into that. Because of that, I created um, a car, a 1985 Chevy El Camino named Maria, who was basically a vehicle for an aesthetic experience. And just a reminder of how everything we do can be um, aesthetic. It can be considered. Um, and so, um, the initial uh, car performance actually happened in 2014 at the Denver Art Museum, where I did a transformance, where I invited um, uh, a group of my buddies, and we finished the car to a certain degree. We took up space, we drove it up the street, and we became warriors, post-apocalyptic indigenous warriors that, that, um, that were embodying the empowerment that I wanted to see. Mm. We did this again in Santa Fe on Canyon Road years later. Um, and so this opportunity, since then I became a mother um, and my conversation with my art and expression has sort of uh, evolved. And so um, I was very interested in what it means to uh, enter into other places, other people's ancestral homelands and transform um, our belief systems and sort of listen a little a little more than you speak. Um, and so I was really excited to, you know, go into um, the ancestral homelands of the people, of the Nevada, <laughs> Nevada's people, ancestral people, um, to go there and consult with what that looks like and what that feels like and what kind of transformation do we want, do we, do they want? Um, to have and how is that all of our story and why does that matter? Um, and so speaking with Vaughn, we were able to come up with this piece and I knew that I had to sit with her and we had to figure this out together and I didn't have all the answers. I can't have all the answers. I'm not um, uh, that uh, being from Southern Nevada and then in the new Wu ancestral homelands is not my story. I can't know what, what needs to happen, but what I can do is, um, is honor that and, and add my prayer to what that looks like as best I can, because I'm just learning to. Um, so with Fawn, we were able to talk about, you know, what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, how can we um, take up space? How do we um, make a moment that is so aesthetically rich for ourselves that transforms our relationship to place? and that being vitally and superbly aware of what place is now um, and how we can, we can inhabit that space. And so we had some wonderful conversations and I'm so happy that Fawn was always the voice of reason <laughs> in so many ways. And um, we really, I, I really, um, I grew from, you know, that camaraderie that we created. And so, you know, Part of that was me suggesting, hey, I'm, I have this idea. And more than having ideas, I actually asked, what should we do? And so, and then tried to listen and see what came. And so with that, um, I would like to see the film that Ben put together. Ben um, managed to follow us around video camera and get his community to support filming it. And so that we can reflect on this and because we were participants, 
we weren't able to sort of see it. And so the film is actually incredibly vital to reflect on this moment and to add to our healing process around it. Um, and it is more of a like a documentation of it that we can then reflect from instead of like a documentary that um, tells you how to feel about it. So hopefully we can all, you know, go into our own fields and find what's there about it. So thank you. Everything that we experience changes us, whether we're in control of it or not. So many times in our lives, we feel like victims to our reality. In our ancestral homelands, we have navigated a lot of powerlessness. How do we use an experience to transform us? Safety, strength, determination, vision, courage. How does that feel in our bodies in space? How do we relate to each other? How do we experience this fully and with witnesses make it truth? Every time we intentionally transform, we evolve and find new ways to create our reality.
right. I think we all needed that moment today. Um, Rose, this is your first time seeing the film in completion, although you've seen some, some versions of it before. Um, can you just share some of your initial reflections as, as we've had a chance to look back? My world is kind of a whirlwind, you know, and I think all of ours are the fact that we are rushing to be here and connect. And I, I really feel like we did something really amazing that we all came together um, and made that happen, that we stopped for just enough time. You know, that was, um, you know, a few minutes of this um, experience that we made space for where we listened and we, we um, let ourselves really um, think about some of those hard things just a few um, aesthetic details. The sound of leather against concrete, right? And the way that the sand crunches between it, it's like, it doesn't sound like other kind of shoes, you know? Um, or just these moments of, of inhabiting a space and then thinking deeply about what this means to be in this space, to have lived this story. And so much in my life, I feel with noise and sound. And we had a, a beautiful week of lots of kids playing and music and sewing and rushing around and laughing and telling stories and um, all to come to this moment of, of really deep um, introspection and pause. And I think in that, you know, watching it again makes me kind of choked up, you know, like I feel that intensity of that moment and also see my daughter, you know, um, participating in all of the metaphors of that, right? Um, that I feel like we don't, we're not, we're not pausing with those um, uncomfortable feelings, even if it is heartbreak, even if it is uh, 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 finding the aesthetic in that moment. And, and so, you know, I like the feeling. It reminds me of, of I don't, I haven't got to, um, every time I stop and think about it, I don't, it's almost like too big of a new neural pathway for me to create that I almost like step away from it. It's hard to stay with. And so watching the film helps me go back to it. And I think that's really important. I think, um, the simplicity of the film and an orientation with your voice and in getting to know you and your work and, and having the privilege to work with you on this project. Um, one thing that I know is that you always start with a question versus an answer. And, you know, so many times in our life, we're trying to find the answers. And um, that's not the case with you. I think, I feel like in, in my time getting to know you, it's really about the journey, not mm -hmm. about the, the final destination. Um, and in the voiceover, in the beginning, you, you mentioned words and you often work with words. So you had safety and strength, courage and determination. Um, we saw the word remember. And during the process leading up to this, remember was written on the door um, to kind of set the tone and intention for everybody who was participating in this. Can you talk a little bit about your experience and, and what you think about how you position these questions in the world? Ooh, I like, I like to, no, I think that's right. And I, and I have to remind myself that, you know, it's not, the, I think so much of our problems with um, colonization and genocide and capitalism and the things that cause the degradation of our environment is objectification. And object, objectification is when you noun something and you take away its life its movement, right? It becomes um, uh, disposable, right? And so when we keep things as verbs, it still breathes, it still moves. There's no answer. There's no end answer to it. It's not stuck, it's not boxed in, right? And so I think um, in our world, we really, really want um, those, those expectations or those outcomes that are dependable, right? Because if not, it's scary. It's scary. And a lot of the reasons I think we objectify is to not face our fear. Um, 
And so, you know, for myself, like I, I'm always doing that. I'm always um, falling into those patterns of avoidance of my fear. And one of the things that I noticed a lot about this, about this project was that something really big shifted in me where what I saw was strength and power was confrontational before where I felt like the way that we make changes, we act, we become this warrior, even if we're not using um, weapons per se, that we, we carry this energy that is confrontational. And is in a sense, I'm, I might even say masculine. Um, and I think becoming a mother, uh, becoming a parent and a nurturer and someone who now has a really deep investment in a future, um, that the what I where I found strength shifted to actually from uh, that confrontational masculine energy to something that was a lot more patient. I found um, you know rocking a child was crying all night long, and you can push yourself further than you ever knew you could, and in a sense you go for you go past your fear or your or your limits. Um, and I think that when we are stuck in our victimry and when we are perpetuating the things that have destroyed us, whether we're indigenous people or whether we're talking about um, our relationship to our planet, um, we forget our, our, our innate strength. And that innate strength is, may not be you know, what we think it is or what we were taught it is, that it might actually be silence, it might actually be patience, it might actually be something that um, is more listening than believing it has answers, right? Um, and is more enjoying of, of our interactions and our relationships. I, you know, when I saw the film, I look at Fawn, I know she's listening, I'm here. <laughs> I look <laughs> at Fawn and I have so much love for this person. And I just can't like, loving coming to love fawn helped me love a part of myself that i didn't even know existed and finding that like um seeing her beauty and her strength and finding um finding our rhythm finding our pattern finding that moment where you don't have to speak and you're still on the same intention as so beautiful and it truly makes you feel like you're not alone in this world where we feel so individual, you know, and objectified that, um, you know, it's so beautiful to, to take that time to connect with somebody and really, and really see them and feel them and feel um, like you can catch that rhythm and, and find deep compassion for it. Um, well, with that, why don't we invite Fawn to join us here? <laughs> she's, I'm sure I caught her and she's in a state of emotion as she's processing the words that you have just said to her. I know you catch me with your words all of the time, um, including this moment. Uh, Fawn, it is so good to see you. You had a tremendous role in the creation and execution of the transformance um, for months. This was a project and a collaboration and it was created with such intention and required um, you as a facilitator and somebody who could help guide the message and give Rose an orientation to what the landscape of Las Vegas is, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but Fawn, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone? I did a very brief intro, but I know that you can do a better job. Oh. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, yes, I got a Wayak Nunanian Fawn, Nick Nwubi, um, speaking to you from our unceded territories of the Southern Paiute lands of Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm still a bit emotional, <laughs> what Rose is saying. So it's hard, it's it's really difficult because I didn't um I didn't watch the video until the moment and I wanted to be have that raw feeling. Of, of what it was. I know I had time before this, but I was like, let's see what I feel. And it was nice to be pulled back to that, that moment. And just thinking about, you know, purpose, purpose, matriarchs, sisters, remembering, land back, land art, and thinking about Rose's questions in the beginning, 
you know, our first meetings is, you know, what, um, how does an indigenous person uh, approach land arts and how do we do it differently? And Rose's answer to that was, well, land back. And I was like, I got a land back story for you. And, <laughs> and so I started to talk about, you know, what we're doing here at New Woo Arts and Activism Studios, where we've taken back, um, you know, some buildings that are on um, Southern Paiute land here in Las Vegas. And what we've been creating here is this, you know, this cohort of, you know, artists and activists, nonprofit organizations, and, you know, wanting to do more things like this. And so this is a way, uh, a very beautiful way, working with Rose, you know, to rematriate land and to reclaim it. And how do we do that uh, collectively and together? And so with that performance and with working with all of the, the artists, you know, these, these Paiute women, these amazing Paiute women, uh, it was it was nice to step forward, you know, in that strength, you know, so when Rose talks about facing fear, um, you know, it is a little, it's a heck, it's really hectic on Maryland Parkway here in the historic country neighborhood. Well, we're on a really busy street, you know, so there's a lot of cars going by. Um, and so when we're walking down the street, you know, we're basically placing ourselves, you know, to be seen. What does it feel like to be, be seen as Native women who are usually invisible? You know, how do we, you know, break that barrier of invisibility and to step into um, this place in this space and reclaim it, reclaim it and take it, to take that land back, even for a day. You know, walking through, I felt nothing but empowered. I was very, I thought I would be shaking. I thought I would be, um, you know, feeling some feelings or like, oh, who's watching or, you know, just, just thinking about that, you know, because when you put yourself as performance, I mean, you're placing yourself for, you're laying your soul bare. Uh, you know, anybody could have, you know, done something honked or disturbed us, but no one did. And walking with Rose and her daughter, with my daughter and, you know, our family members from our Paiute community, I felt nothing but strength and calm and to just slow down time just a little bit, uh, you know, stepping, you know, a few seconds and then pausing, stepping, then pausing and to be in this, this wave, you know, moving like water, but together was, was really powerful, really powerful. And to even take back that space where the Huntridge Circle Park is, you know, that place has been closed for, for many years but to reclaim it as ours, you know, just for that time, uh, just processing all yeah. of the things, I swear. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about land. We were on the movie land in Southern Nevada, um, Las Vegas area. Rose, this is distinctly different from Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, and was this your first time in Las Vegas for any period of time? Um, can we talk a little bit about what it felt like for you to come into this space and come into this landscape that was completely different, um, coming with your own intention, but how did the landscape and, you know, we went through many iterations trying to identify the right place for the transformance to happen. Um, talk to us a little bit about what it was like to approach, approach Las Vegas region. Um, it was... You know, I'm going to be honest, I never really wanted to go to Las Vegas. <laughs> and um, and I, I really, I'm so glad that my introduction to Las Vegas area was, was through this project, because now I have like this dear love for Las Vegas, and it's not for, I think, what other people love it for, right? It's for something that I, I feel is a lot... Um, I felt like I, I had an experience that is that was really um, singular, you know. Um, we had talked about different environments to do this piece, um, and Fawn had presented, um, you know, uh, locations outside of the city and then also within the city. Um, and initially, we had wanted to um, to do the piece um, there near the um, tribal. Um, businesses in, the, in, the, in a location that was the tribal businesses area. Um, and mostly because it was a direct relationship to, um, you know, indigenous people um, being in relationship to place and that place changes, you know. And I've been thinking how 
you know, going back to San and Clara Pueblo, where I still live, um, that we're really um, privileged to have our ancestral homelands very similar to how they once were in lots of ways. And that's, that's not a, a metropolitan area. And, you, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't been developed as much as other places. I think of like um, Lenape uh, territory in New York City, right? Uh, or, you know, how Las Vegas um, took over this area of, of ancestral Paiute land, right? Um, and so to be in a situation where, where you can't really necessarily undo something like that once it becomes a metropolis, but how do you, how do you be in that space with reverence, in reverence to the story? And that story may not necessarily be pretty, but it's also transformational as in we're indigenous people having to live um, um, a contemporary life in this, in this world. And, and how it's been. Um, and I think often about being a guest. And I felt like when I went to, uh, I got to have that feeling of like, okay, when we enter into spaces that are not um, our home, right? We're a guest and we should, we should remember how to be a guest in another place. And oftentimes that is to listen and to pay attention. And it was an interesting situation for me to be a leader in a sense of this project, but also having to be a guest and being like, well, how do I feel about this? And how do I listen more than I would otherwise? And how do I manage my stress so that, <laughs> so that I'm still maintaining my respect as much as possible? And I think that um, that's an important thing to think about when we enter into everywhere we go is someone's home, whether it's a bird or someone's ancestral homelands or you know, the, a wall that, that the sun graces every day, that's a home, that's someone's home, and we're always a guest no matter what, right? So how do we approach that? And also be very um, aware of ourselves instead of falling into like, I'm a bad thing because I didn't do it right. Like, how do you sit in your strength and find that strength from a place that's unfamiliar, you know? And I think that um, being that wave that Fawn talked about was like, um, in a sense, how do you become more with a place, you know, and aware of and in, in, a, in sort of a dance with it rather than against it, you know, and even though, and I think like South Maryland Parkway had a lot of cars and it was really intense and the feeling of being seen because it just from the general public because of the cars and then crossing the road and then, um, and then, you know, when we were walking out, we stopped at the, at the point of Huntridge Circle Park and stood in that, in the, in the river of cars for this really intense amount of time. And it felt incredibly powerful because I think um, going back to that like heavy handed way of taking land back, it's like instead of, of, of existing in the colonial perspective of relationship with land, as a commodity, as an objectification, what happens when we give the land back to itself and become a part of that land again, even if it is standing in a median on a river of cars and just really being there, like being there. And what does that feel like? Um, and how is that land back in a whole different way? And we have two big kind of players in the performance. One was the land and your relationship to it and observance and reflection. Um, but the other was community. And there was a, a big lead up to the transformance where several members of the Southern Paiute uh, community were engaged in designing regalia, um, coming together in a shared space at New Art and Activism Studios. Um, and as we approached the project, there was a lot of openness, open-endedness to the project that was to be informed by community. Um, Fawn and Rose together, if maybe the two of you can talk, I'll start with you Fawn, if you could talk a little bit about the process of working with Rose to identify who was going to be a part of the transformance. Um, and then I also just want to acknowledge the extended community because we had the, the women that we see represented in the film here 
Um, but there was a much larger community of people who were there late into the night, early in the morning, you know, bringing different um, different personal things that they could share and add to the conversation. Um, so Fawn, maybe you can talk a little bit about the development of the community as you're share trying to relay Rose's concept, which is still a little open. And then Rose, if you can kind of come in and talk a little bit about how um, the open-endedness was really informed by the, the women who came together. Thank you so much. Ooh, that is a long question. Uh, but when I think about <laughs> community, I mean, that's what our uh, Nibu arts and activism facilities are about, is community. We're building community here. So even when I had a listing of, you know, there were many, many people who could have been a part of this. And I had a whole slideshow of all of these different women because it isn't just about our Southern Paiute community, you know, because um, our tribe, we're only, we're one of the smallest tribes in North America. We're just a little over 54, 55 tribal members. But in Las Vegas, there's over 50,000 plus, you know, Native Americans who call the city home. And, you know, that it extends into other indigenous peoples, other indigenous communities. So there are many people who are, you know, behind the scenes and, you know, assisting and even the people who are chosen, uh, because we wanted to shine a spotlight on like the Southern Paiute. Well, these are Southern Paiute lands, you know, let's work within the Southern Paiute community. And so, um, my, my daughter, Soul, she was chosen to be a part of it. And uh, Gina Yazi from the Las Vegas Paiute community uh, was also a part of it. And these young women, um, also with uh, my Aunt Katie, Katie Anderson, you know, these are strong Paiute women. And they are very much involved in, you know, learning their language, involved in regalia making, they're involved, involved in beadwork and so many things. And they're passing on these skills, especially these youth dan dancers are passing on their skills to others. And so when it comes to, you know, supporting uh, the, this place, supporting Rose and supporting these dancers, of course, they had so much support uh, as well as Posse. You know, Posse with the Melendez family coming through and being able to just, whoa, just so, so quick. <laughs> I learned a thing or two from Teresa Melendez, uh, you know, during these workshops. But others, you know, just coming to take part or swing by, you know, from our Paiute community on their bikes and check it out for a little bit and like, all right, that's what's up. And it was just nice to have just all of these different pockets of time where we had, you know, people coming in and stopping in. Um, or outside because we did a lot of making um, outside in the back, um, the back patio area. Uh, it, and it was really interesting to be able to, you know, come together, of course, you know, like we're in a pandemic. So how are we maneuvering around space and time, you know, and being within these spaces and making sure that we're taking care of ourselves and the people around us too. Uh, so that was also, you know, a factor. But, you know, with this, with this space, you know, we're creating this community and as Rose, uh, I realized she was basically our first artist in residence and to activate the space in such a major way, you know, to pull in all of these different artists and people was, was huge, absolutely huge. I still just beam about it, <laughs> about that, you know, because it was a few weeks where we spent time. And we also spent time around the, the Awani exhibition. And so here's another you know, group of native women coming through from different tribes of the Southwest you know, to activate the space even more. Uh, so it wasn't just that moment in time. Um, I would love to see a whole film <laughs> on just the process of it because the process was so, so important. You know, all of those different uh, uh, communications, all those different conversations Rose sitting down with each uh, participant and getting to know them, getting to know about who they are, what their dreams are, what their goals are, you know, who they are as a person, not just like, all right, we're getting together, we're going to make these things, and th there it is. It was an effort of getting to know the spirit of each, uh, each woman that was within this. Rose? One of my favorite memories of the experience, um, and I think this was that moment where I realized the importance of coming together for something like this, that there is no way I could have pulled that off without everyone's help. And that everyone, um, even if, if it was a voice of reason, like, hey, maybe we should tone that back just a little bit so we're not like stressing ourselves out so hard, um, but also like, 
people being excited. Oh, that looks so cool. Let me try. Or, hey, uh, I want to, you know, and, and when the people came together, uh, all the participants painted their own belts and that moment where, where I could see their individual creative processes like flourish and then wanting to be proud of sort of an, an identity or to represent that. Be, have their like direct aesthetic hand in that was so cool. But one of the my, one of my favorite memories was um, so we're working at New World Arts and um, Fawn is simultaneously um, remodeling another one of the buildings, and she had a friend um, bring his flatbed truck, who's part of the arts community there, um, that was full of of these panels of I think it was roof paneling that needed to be unloaded. And there was, you know, and they were there starting to unload. I was like, everybody, let's go and we'll unload it. And we all went over there and we had, you know, 10 people giving their all their hands and we unloaded that truck happily, you know, and 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 um it reminded me of of the importance of community. And I think like what you were saying, that we're in a pandemic and we're trying to do what's best for the community and take care of each other. Um and a lot of that has been really um, socially distanced and, and um, disconnected from, from our communities and each other. And that and just having making the space to really come together and having the resource of the really nice weather. And also, you know, having that outside area with the tables and chairs and these fences where kids can run around and play outside and really feel like we could sit around and listen to music and tell stories. Um, another amazing moment, I think, that hit me really hard was, you know, hearing about, you know, stories about our lives. We share, oh, yeah, that reminds me of, oh, when I was a kid, and we tell those stories while we're working. And as I was driving, as I was leaving Las Vegas, and I was driving north, uh, northeast out of the city, and I, um, I crossed through a reservation, right? Um, and it was, you know, the box of Ancestral Homeland. And it was the first time in my life that reservation felt like a suffocation rather than a safety. And my whole life, a reservation had been, in my myself, a place where you go and you, um, you hide and you're protected from colonization, right? A res is a safe place. And when I was driving through it for the first time in my life, I had seen it as um, a limit as this really, really, really heartbreaking suffocation of people. And, and I hadn't been able to have that perspective of my own experience or any other Native people I had until I spent time there. Um, and then um, really got to build a perspective that was, it's like, how do you look at yourself, but through somebody else and able to see something you weren't able to otherwise, which, you know, those kinds of things really helped me to grow, I think, my understanding of what's possible and also to break my heart even more around what has been. And I think it was an important part of my heart that needed to break. Um, we see in the film and, and at the Transformance Live the regalia and the objects of adornment that were created for the Transformance specifically. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role that regalia plays in the Transformance and in your performance work um, and how the, the origination of new regalia is a, a critical part of that? I really feel like um, when we dress ourselves, when we dress ourselves up in a sense or like um, become something uh, other than our familiar day to day, every day we dress up and we put on a performance to go through the day and we make aesthetic decisions about what we wear and how that will affect our reality through fashion, right? But when it's out of our norm in a sense, or it's special, like I wanted all the things that we made to be able to be worn again um, in all of the participants' lives, right? So it had, so for me, it had to feel, um, like special for this moment, but also um, a dressy thing to, to help us love ourselves in those moments where we are able to revisit that regalia, right? Um, and that, that specialness, when you take the time to care for your appearance, um, 
for me, it makes me focus on my body and my identity and space and how, how I can stand with a little bit more self-respect in those moments and how do you do that, right? Um, and then I really, I really love these moments when me and Fawn were designing the, the dresses. We had a, um, she had a whiteboard on the wall and we, we had our pens and we were designing the dresses the way that we felt like they should be, um, you know, based on ancestral designs, right? Um, um, traditional patterns. Um, and also like how we can make it referencing the color of the ground or the, what are the materials? Why do we use this natural beads? And, and why in a place like Vegas that's very sparkly would we choose to have like very natural beads and, and use the clay itself and make these beads with intention? Um, and so I really felt like the process itself was about, you know, transforming ourselves into those influential beings in a, in a, in a, in a deeply aesthetic moment and in that we are influential more than we would if we weren't intentionally influential right um yeah fawn when you're in the film we see that you have a beautiful basket that you're wearing as your hat and this is part of your traditional uh, regalia and it's something um that we learned was taboo right for you rose it's not part of your tradition and to wear a hat has a completely different implication um fawn why don't you talk to us a little bit about the the different kinds of objects or um regalia or objects of adornment that you've brought with you as personalized items um and then maybe rose you can talk a little bit about why they're different for you Thank you. Uh, yes, those uh, those woven hats are traditional. Um, they're from this uh, local artist from the Wapa Band of Paiutes. His name's Everett. Their name is Everett Pickovit, and he's a master weaver. And tra traditionally, uh, it's usually the women who do the the weaving. Um, but this culture, or this, hasn't been passed on, or it's, it's a it's a tradition that's laying dormant. I'm not going to say that it's gone because it's being revitalized. But Everett Pickovit has, you know, uh, shared so much and especially around those hats. So it was an honor to be able to, I actually um, commissioned one of the hats and I won the other one in a raffle to support. <laughs> <the> <laughs> I was supporting this elders, their, their, um, their kitchen burned down and the community had this whole like, you know, raffle going. So I bought of all these tickets anyways. So I, I won and I got that for my daughter and it fits her perfectly. So it's a, uh, it was really nice to have that and to have that identifier of us like that is a identifier of being a southern Paiute woman and to have such a woven hat is it's really it's almost like you're wearing bling or something you wear it all proud and all tough <laughs> uh, but even the colors that we use that we that we chose were colors from this area like when we think about the Red Rock Conservation Area or Sloan Canyon or the Valley of Fire or Gold Butte you know, it's all these beautiful sandstone rock formations and these red, rich red tones. Um, I had the the yellow or the golden uh, bias tape on the side of my uh, regalia specifically, you know, for Gold Butte and just thinking about that fight that we are, the fight for the land, you know, to get that designated as a national monument. And so I wanted that, that signifier, that color, you know, within my regalia and to be able to paint, you know, different designs and basket patterns on my belt, you know, the black paint that was on the, the leather, uh, you know, one of those marks is one, um, you know, for my great, great grandmother, uh, Topsy Sweeney Kipe. Um, and so that design is very special to me. Anytime I've gone to see her work, you know, in the, like, like at the Lost City Museum, I feel more connected to her. And every time I draw this within some of my work, I feel, you know, this, this connection to the past and, you know, bringing it back into the, the present and the future. So everything that was worn or created was made with good intentions and with good memories and good stories around them. And to be in that place of making with my, my daughter and to be in this conversation and to share that with Rose too, to, you know, from talking with another woman from another tribe, like, oh, how do you do it over there? Oh, that's how we do it over here. And to have that uh, that banter, <laughs> you know, back and forth. And um, I think it was really important to hear from the other uh, participants too on, you know, what they liked. I mean, Katie did something that was, you know, very florally. It was very her. 
and it was fairly beautiful and each person had some kind of signifier of just themselves not necessarily something that was like like oh this is Paiute it's like no I'm more this is a, something I I like and something I enjoy you know this is a design that you know came you know it just flowed freely or uh just came from the heart and so the the process of making each one of those was um was, was monumental because there, there will never be another one like that. It is very special to each person. One thing um, that I did was, was I made shoes. I made the moccasins for everybody. And it was the first time I had made those kind of moccasins. So that was like a steep learning curve. And it was, it was a strong investment. But um, there was a moment where me and Fawn were talking. And, and um, I was like... I got to make some for me too. And I was, and I had brought my own traditional moccasins from home that I have, I didn't make, but I have worn for ceremony in my life. And, and there was this moment where I was like, no, Rose, you have to wear your own shoes, you know? And that was like, you know, where your, you know, the skin between your feet and the earth has to be like this familiar relationship and the way that you walk comes from your background and your history. And those kinds of moments that were really beautiful. Um, I really appreciated those things and those like, just having someone who's brave enough to really go there with me and then bounce those ideas off and, and go try and figure out, you know, it's a really amazing metaphor that we're these human beings who are living in a post-colonial existence and we're trying to figure it out and we're bouncing it off each other and, and hopefully we can reflect that beauty and the confidence and create community to make healthier, you know, the most healthy decisions for ourselves and our families into the future, you know, like Kwan was saying, like, there's so many things that are dormant, and in a sense, it's up to us to be brave enough to pick it up and, and try it, and sometimes it's, there's a, it's very heavy, <laughs> but if we walk slow enough, we can do it, you know. And we'll come back to some, some kind of deeper reflections, but I want to acknowledge, you know, that we we had, you had an individual experience, you had a collective experience with the group that was walking together. Um, and then there was an extended experience. So we had audience and spectators and we had a virtual component to that. We had an Instagram live that was happening. Um, and throughout the process, you know, how had you thought about the engagement of a spectator or the engagement of an audience or the engagement of somebody with insider information versus absolutely no information? Because we also had people that were in the park who had no idea of what was happening. Um, and then we had different varying levels of depth of knowledge of the, the audience who was there. So Rose, can you talk a little bit about what, and actually Ben Alex is the filmmaker. Um, part of that kind of back ground audience and spectatorship is also the collection of the footage. Um, so Ben, Ben Alex, if I can bring you into the fold here, um, we'll have Rose reflect on that and then we'll talk to you a little bit about your experience. Um, so Rose. So one of the things that I'm really sensitive of or I'm, I'm conscious of because I have a trigger around it, I'll be honest, is the objectification and the exotification of indigenous people. And I feel often that that there is a desire to have all the answers from people who are who are outside of that experience and part of part of me wants to reclaim that and saying you know we don't have to do it for other people we can do it for ourselves and that there's the witnessing is vital but it's also um it, it doesn't require um oodles of narrative in order to take care of of the discomfort of other in lots of ways. And I think that's an important, um, um, you know, muscle to strengthen. Uh, and so we talked a lot about, you know, how much do we share and where is that appropriate? And then, and then where do we do this for ourselves and our ancestors? And we're having a conversation, understanding that, you know, there's Instagram, there's uh, a filmmaking, there's, there's actual people who showed up from all over the country to be a part of this. And you know who else was witness was the trees and the birds and the plants and the ground and the little stones that we stepped on and the sky and the ancestors, right? And so when who do we put as priority here? And I find that um, that's always interesting for me and I like to deconstruct that. 
Um, and, but I'm really yeah. grateful for Ben, Ben Alex, and and you know your your perspective on how to how to catch that. You know. So Ben Alex, um, if you could go ahead and just give a, a nice introduction to yourself for everybody here, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ben Alex Dupree. Uh, I'm from the Kaaba Indian Reservation, Sanayix and Intiat, Wenatchee. Uh, where I grew up, uh, my my dad was Mini Kanju Lakota, enrolled there. So um, I have a lot of family, you know, splitting between South Dakota and the Plateau. Uh, I'm a filmmaker and artist living here in Las Vegas, is guest on uh, New Land, uh, and also a member of the arts, the New Arts and Activism Collective there at, at here in Vegas. Um, ben Alex, in so many ways, as a filmmaker, you're a voyeur. You know, you're looking from the outside in, but you're also trying to tell a story, and that story can change um, depending on whose story you're trying to share. The vision of Rose, the vision of the filmmaker, a completely different interpretation, um, and certainly through this process, there was that push and pull. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to view all of the footage and try to compile it into a succinct story, um, but also recognize, you know, the voice of, of Rose coming through? Yeah, I mean, th th this was a complicated cut in, in a way, you know, um, because, you know, there isn't any anything added, you know, the, the, the tools that I usually use in my work is, is you know, over composites, overlays, color, you know, just dramatic music, finding ways to just, you know, it's, that's just my style. I'm, I'm, I'm like that. But Rose is definitely the, the, the whole piece was built in a way to honor the 12 step cadence of the walking to highlight the natural sounds of, of, of the place, of uh, the street, the traffic, um, you know, just the experience of being immersed and taking something that was so, you know, that, that was a long experience um, and trying to contextualize it within, you know, five or six minutes to make it, you know, part of, um, you know, a truncated part of today's program. But ultimately, for me, you know, learning, I've learned a lot from Rose, and, and especially the way that Rose and Fawn were working on this project. Everything was really minimalist and stripped down, and the the reflection on uh, the matriarch and the design and the contrast of the city, the modernity and the traditional are all very, like, very strong, you know, design concepts and, 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 and performance ideas. Uh, so for me, it was just really trying to get out of the way and just take the material make it look respectful and, and immersive and and uh, not skip around in a way that made it feel like it took you out of the moment um, and then just really focusing on the messaging and and so i think for me the process went like this you know i'd build something up and we'd go no strip it back okay cool and then i make something else strip it back and it was after like the third time that rose was like strip it back <laughs> i was like okay let's just make this super, super clean. And then, and when I did that, I was like, oh, that's exactly what it was supposed to be. So I was, I was uh, enjoying the notes that I was getting and uh, it helped me reframe the way that I think about projects when you really push to the limit in terms of just not having to rely on any of the filmmaking tricks that make things slick for the internet, you know? Uh, so it was a really beautiful process and um, I'm, I'm really proud of how it looks and what it meant and, Hopefully, it's a good representation of what happened that day. Yeah, and um, so Fawn and Rose, both as the performers, and and Fawn with, with this as your, um, I'm sorry, Rose with this as your your original concept. During the transformance, your experience did not include the audience. You couldn't see them. You know, you were front of the line, um, and the audience proceeded behind you, but at a great distance. So I don't even know if you could hear them, um, but I know that you could not see them. So your procession um, was very much about you and the bodies right next to you, immediately next to you, the earth below you, the sky above you, the noises around you, um, but, but not really in a real direct relation to the audience. And then as you had an opportunity to see Ben Alex's film and the way that he portrayed that event, um, it's kind of the first time that you could look back and see. So what was that experience like? I remember um, I had called my mom and I was like, I don't think anyone came. Because <laughs> 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 I, I, 
didn't see anyone. I didn't see anyone. You know, there was a moment where um, Fawn's partner ran in front to help this woman push a shopping cart across the street. Um, <laughs> and there were also some people sleeping in the park that we stepped around and didn't wake. Um, and they may never know that even happened. And I thought that those were those were the people I was aware of. That's about it. <laughs> um, and so there was this like, what happens when you're not doing it for anyone else? You're doing it for because you have this intention of change, right? And 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 when you're not performing or putting on a show necessarily, but you're just creating the guidelines for an experience that is transformative and if it can transform me and I'm terrified and I'm in that moment like deeply aware of myself and everything that's happening and and counting and singing in a rhythm which kept me so present you have you can't start thinking about something else because you're counting this rhythm so you're very very present um and then hoping that you know now seeing how many people were there was pretty magical and then thinking you know I wonder you know if that, I mean, it's pretty amazing that they stayed quiet, that I didn't even notice those people were following and very um, um, reverent as well to that experience. And hopefully they got to feel some of those same things that I felt and they were transformed as well. Well, you know, just thinking about that, that moment too, because I, of course, I couldn't see behind us. We, we only knew afterwards that there were people following us. Um, you know, after we were kind of recapping about the event and such, and I was thinking about like, you know, what, what a beautiful metaphor too, about how indigenous women are leading indigenous women are at the forefront of this art and moving forward and all right, what do we do next? And the people are following and listening too. I'm seeing this in different ways, you know, through the arts and how places are transforming, whether it be institutions, museums. Um, or other art spaces, you know, like what do we do that's more intentional and respectful to the lands that we're, we're taking space on? And how do we respect that and do that in a good way? And so what I'm seeing is, you know, that as a metaphor, that's how I was interpreting that following, you know, what you have all these people, and these are people within the arts communities, from other galleries, from our, um, from our Las Vegas community, within our community. And, you know, they're following, you know, with us in rhythm with us too i thought that was really something to see in the in the movie or in this film um it, it was really really powerful really powerful mm -hmm. but also to take that time like all right this is for us and not to you know go out with the the audience right away when we went into and stepped into that room i don't know how much rose wants to share about what happened in that room but that was a time for us and we reflected and there was, you know, a lot of emotion and feeling and, you know, just taking the time to no, we're going to feel this. Let's, let's sit with this, you know, let's, you know, think about it and, you know, and, and laugh and smile and do, you know, all the things, you know, that we wanted to do. Uh, so I thought that was um, really something too, because, you know, with performance or, you know, any kind of art or exhibition, you know, you're going out there to greet the people and they're questioning you and talking and there's a lot of energy exchange after that. So I was, I was really pleased that we didn't have to, you know, go outside right away to do that because that can drain, that could be really draining too. You know, as an artist, when you make the scene and you're talking with a lot of people, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. It can be, it can be a lot. <laughs> um, just being cognizant of time, I want to come back to some of the words again that we had in the film. Um, you shared safety and strength, determination, courage. Remember was the constant theme that we had, um, that you had shared and you had set as the intention for all of the work that led up to the transformance. And um, then of course the transformance itself. And now we have a look to the future and how we're informed by it. Um, I, Rose, you and I have had other conversations and Fawn also just about how the experience is different for everybody and the transformance um, that you experienced, Fawn, is different than the one that I experienced as somebody who had the opportunity to work on the project. Fawn, you know, Ben Alex, um, all of the performers that were a part of it were transformed in a different way. Um, and I think what you always ask people to do is reflect and that's what the transformance was set up to do, to give us an opportunity to pause, to um, contemplate 
and to reflect. So I guess I would like to conclude today's program uh, with you, Rose, sharing your reflections on the transformance, the word transformance, um, and what it looks like, you know, as you take this reflection forward. I've been transformed by this, so, <laughs> you know, and I think that the transformance is, is working its way through me slowly, and it's, and it's showing me new layers of its existence, or it's, it's the transition is, is going through my cells and, and becoming who I am, you know, as slowly as those 12 steps in the past, and the 12 steps in the past. Um, and I'm grateful. I feel like what I'm trying to remember is, is my strength and our community and what matters. And I'm trying to remember how to listen. I'm trying to remember to slow down. I'm trying to remember to honor myself and take the moment to, to do what's needed to, to go move through the world um, with self-respect and remembering that I'm not a victim and I can make this change. I can make, I can make change for myself. Um, and, and through that, hopefully the ones around me. Um, and I'm going to remember this and with, especially with the film, I'm, I'm excited to be able to revisit it over and over again. And I know in a year I'll see something new and in two years I'll see something new and I'll, and I'll be, I'm so grateful that we did this together. And, you know, that gratitude is, is immense. And I feel like some of that remembering is also faith that, that we're doing. Is if we stop and listen, we'll know which way to go and how to do this. Um, thank you, Rose, Fawn, Ben, Alex. It was my privilege to be able to be a part of it and to host today's conversation, um, especially as we wrap up the art and environment conference season for the Nevada Museum of Art. Um, we hope that the content shared throughout the season and especially in this final reflection and closing program will inform the way that all of us can transform by the content of all of the artists and scholars that we heard from. Um, Rose, I'm happy to know you. I'm happy to continue a relationship with you. Um, Fawn, this is just the beginning. You know, we've had a, a young relationship that continues to grow and evolve in new ways. And I appreciate um, that in every everyone's activism in this group, there is a, a call in. There is always this opportunity to call in, to come together, to lead into something that we can um, continue to grow and work together on. And so I'm happy to know both of you and thank you all for joining us here today. Thank you for all of our season participants, for the museum's general audience and everybody who came to participate in the conversation. I hope we give you a point of reflection. Um, the full season is available through YouTube. It's probably the easiest way to access all of our conference programs. Um, through the Nevada Museum of Arts YouTube channel. Um, this will be added to that. And if you were a season subscriber, you also have access through the season platform. Um, thank you so much. I could not think of a better way to end. And I am just grateful for both of you, for all of you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Fawn. Thank you, Ben. Love you. Thank you. Love you. <laughs>